I want to introduce John Kitzhaber, former governor of Oregon, uh, former state senate president, former ER doc. You have a lot to teach us, sir, and we're really honored that you've come to Texas and, and are participating here today. So without further ado, let's give him a round of applause and welcome to the stage. Good morning. You know, this is the second year I've actually participated with, uh, with DJ, and I have to say that he has this almost sort of Churchillian ability to stimulate a conversation, and I was in one last night with people of very diverse backgrounds, and uh, always a positive result and something I think people, uh, people learn from. For si Thank you, uh, DJ, for all you're doing in this space. Um, it's really good to be here. I must admit that I... Uh, <clears throat> I told a, a political colleague of mine, an old, very partisan warhorse, that I was planning to travel from a blue state that had expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act to a red state that chose not to expand. And he says, my God, what are, could you possibly have to talk about? <clears throat> and <clears throat> I think that statement says it all. I think it captures this erosion in uh, community and this sense of common purpose that has left us fragmented as a society and with a polarized a Congress. Uh, and, um, you know, the fact is, I don't think we can solve many of the big challenges that face us today if we try to do it strictly through a partisan or ideological lens. And I think that's particularly true of health care. <clears throat> now, I uh, hate this distinction between red states and blue states, but I'm going to use it here for just a moment to make a point. If you look at the electoral map of the United States, what strikes you is how red it is. And there's these few blue patches scattered about, and one of them is up in the northwest, which is the, the blue state of Oregon. But here's the interesting thing. If you look at a county electoral map of Oregon, it looks just like the United States. It's very, very red with a few little blue spots up there. Now, I don't know many people in the red state of Texas, but I know a lot of people in the red parts of Oregon, and they're just like you and me. They're working hard to make ends meet. They have dreams and aspirations. They worry about the same things everyone else worries about. Their kids, their future, their job, and increasingly, uh, how they're going to pay for health care. <clears throat> so it seems to me if we can remember that and step back for just a moment from the partisan bitterness in Washington, D.C. and take a dispassionate look at the problem we're trying to solve, I think it's very, very possible uh, to develop a, a solution. And the problem is simply this. The cost of health care exceeds the ability of almost everybody uh, to pay for it. That's it in a nutshell. And it's not a new problem. We've been trying to fix this problem for over 50 years. Uh, dating back to 1965 when we passed Medicare <clears throat> and Medicaid. A program for the elderly and a program for the poor. Now, Medicare, interestingly enough, is the only part of our system built on the notion of universal access. It's an entitlement program for everybody over the age of 65, regardless of their financial means. Medicaid was supposed to be a program for low-income Americans, the safety net, if you will, but it really has never been that. Because to be eligible for Medicaid, not only do you have to be below a certain income level, you have to fit into a category. The main categories, of course, are pregnant women, families with dependent children, and the aged, blind, and disabled. So if you're a single adult or a childless couple, you're not eligible for Medicaid, regardless of how deeply impoverished uh, you might be. Now, in addition to these two publicly financed programs, as you know, there are public subsidies also involved in the private commercial health side of the system, because employers can deduct from their taxable income the cost of their contribution to their employees' health care. So this amounts to a publicly financed tax benefit for people who have employer-sponsored group coverage. And that's where, of course, most of their workers get their health insurance. But there's this growing number of workers who don't have group coverage and have to buy a policy on the individual market, <clears throat> which is usually much more expensive. So the problem with this system is that it leaves a lot of people out. It leaves out people who are under the age of 65, who don't meet the income or categorical requirements for Medicaid, who, can't, who don't uh, get workplace through um, their, their uh, don't, don't get coverage for the workplace, and can't afford a policy on the private individual market. So uh, the, the system is a little more bizarre if you think about it, because, because people over the age of 65 are the only ones who have an entitlement to health care. Employers and legislators can avoid their exposure to rising prices by simply shifting those costs to individuals. And employers do it by dropping coverage altogether, which is why you have a growing number of people in the individual market. 
or by raising co-payments and deductibles to the point that their employees for all practical purposes are uninsured. And the state does exactly the same thing, particularly by changing income eligibility uh, to, to reduce uh, enrollment. So the irony and the great contradiction in American public policy is that the ability to cost shift provides a de facto policy of universal access to a nation that doesn't have one. Because when these people get sick enough or can't find a primary provider, they go to the ED, where federal, require, federal law requires they be seen and treated. Uh, and so we end up as a society paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to treat someone's stroke in the hospital rather than spending a few dollars a day to manage someone's blood pressure in the community. Uh, and of course, um, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense from a, a, either an economic policy or, or a social policy. Now, um, <clears throat> the ability to, uh, to cost shift uh, also takes, reduces the political pre uh, pressure for change, but it gets even a little bit more irrational because the uncompensated care of those people in the gap is shifted back to the third party payers through increases in their premiums and their bills, perpetuating, perpetuating the cycle. The only way this arrangement could save money is if we'd passed a law that said that if you don't have health insurance, we're gonna let you die on the ambulance ramp. And I don't think there's anyone in Texas or Oregon or the United States Congress who would support that kind of policy. So it was the people in the coverage gap that the Affordable Care Act was designed to help. Now that doesn't seem like such a bad idea, it seems like a pretty good motive, right? But once it got inside the beltway, the initial motive got entirely lost. So the Republicans view the uh, Affordable Care Act as probably the worst evil vested on mankind since the dawn of time. And the Democrats view it as some kind of perfect product of immaculate conception. And so there's not really a lot of room for a conversation uh, given those two, uh, those two dis disparate views. And I think actually it has more to do with political advantage in the next election than it does trying to solve this chronic problem that's really uh, a tapeworm, if not a cancer, uh, to, our, to our economy. Nonetheless, uh, the Affordable Care Act tried, and, and this is an oversimplification, but it tried to help the people in that coverage gap in two ways. One, it expanded Medicaid to 138% of the federal poverty level, and it included the single adults and childless couples, the ones that the Republicans refer to as uh, the able-bodied adults. And it paid 100% of that cost for the first couple of years, and then that drops to 90% in 2020. And then secondly, it tried to address the problems in the commercial market, particularly the individual market, through uh, a, a, a mandate, a prohibition on excluding coverage based on pre-existing conditions, and then cost sharing and premium subsidies in the, uh, uh, in the exchange. Now it's interesting that most of the debate and focus both politically and from the media has been on the problems in the individual market, which is only about 7% of the people who are covered in the country. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on that this morning. Uh, when I'm done, if you want, we can talk about the controversy about the mandate and the way the ACA approached the, the commercial uh, market. But, but I want to really focus on the Medicaid expansion because it's that debate it, it, that exposes the flaws in the Affordable Care Act and also the flaws in, in the efforts to repeal and, and replace it. And it's in this debate that we're brought face to face that the, with, uh, with the one issue that has to be addressed if we want to craft a sustainable and equitable uh, path forward and that's the total cost of care, which is really why I think uh, Warren Buffett et al. have gotten involved in this issue. It's more about cost, I think, uh, than anything else. So here's the basic political conflict and the basic partisan blind spot. From its inception, Medicaid has been a state-federal partnership uh, in which the federal government pays or matches every dollar the, the state spends on, on, on Medicaid. And that match rate is based on a formula that compares the state's per capita income with the national average. So lower, states, uh, lower income states get higher, uh, higher match rate. And uh, the problem, uh, according to the Republicans, is, this is, is that this is an open-ended financing arrangement. And, and I think in, in a way they're right. And what that means is that when state costs go up, either uh, because of uh, increased enrollment or just a higher per, per member per month cost, the federal government matches that without question. So in other words, if healthcare spending goes up at the state level, the federal government pays that cost without question. So the Republican, Solution to this is basically uh, block grants uh, and, and per capita caps. <clears throat> now, the Democrats hate block grants and per capita caps for a couple of reasons. One, it ends the federal government's 52-year 52 gar 52 guarantee that we will match all state Medicaid spending, and they're worried that the caps won't keep up with the growth of health care, and so at the end, states will come up short, and that'll be reflected in uh, lower enrollment and, and, and lower benefits. 
The problem with both of these approaches is that they don't put any pressure on the delivery system. So the Republican approach shifts costs to states, doesn't manage costs, it shifts costs, and the Democratic approach just accepts the cost of health care without, uh, without question. So um, <clears throat> it's the cost of care that is the elephant in the room. Uh, the total cost of care is what drives the politics and the polarization, <clears throat> because health care is the only economic sector that produces goods and services that the vast majority, majority of its customers can't afford, yet all of whom will need at some point as a matter of life or death. And the only way a market works under that system is if it's heavily subsidized. So the health care debate for the last 50 years has been focused on the revenue side, in, in other words, how to pay for the cost of those subsidies, either through public insurance or private insurance. And that's really what the debate is. If you, if you peel, it, peel the layers of the underway, uh, onion away, that's what's going on with the ACA debate. So, for example, one of the major goals of Republican efforts to repeal and replace Obamacare is to reduce the cost of Medicaid to the federal government, which is not the same as reducing the cost of the care being provided through the Medicaid program. It's just about who pays the bill, right? And ultimately, the bill is unaffordable. So the politics simply shift those costs to states, to employers, to providers, and ultimately to consumers uh, who can't afford it. The problem is that this is not a debate about system costs. It's not a debate about uh, why those goods and services cost so much. Again, it's just about uh, who pays the bill. So basically, we've got a situation where the Republicans believe that the cost of care is too high uh, and is financially unsustainable, and they're right. And the Democrats believe that any reduction in federal health care spending will end up reducing benefits and enrollment, and given the proposals on the table, they're right as well. But what if we could find a different way? What if there's a, a middle pass that would allow us to uh, reduce, significantly reduce the cost of health care while giving more people access to the system, uh, a better population health, uh, more productive workforce? And I think one of the problems with this debate is the way it's been framed. And so what I want to talk to you this morning is a third way that I think uh, could find us a, a bipartisan uh, path forward. And to do that, we've got to go back to 2011. So Oregon, like Texas, I'm sure, was in the depths of the Great Recession. We had high unemployment, a very divided state, a divided legislature, a huge budget deficit, and the specter of significant reductions in provider reimbursement rates. So one of the reasons it's hard to reform the healthcare system is because we keep paying for it. As long as you pay for the status quo, there's absolutely no incentive to change it. Well, in Oregon in 2011, an incentive arrived in the form of a $1.2 billion hole in the Medicaid budget. And we, we saw very clearly that if we continue to maintain coverage for everyone who was available or eligible, it would have been about a 39% reduction in provider reimbursement rates. So basically through uh, some administrative changes, changing our benefit a little, and front-end loading the resources we did have into the first year of Oregon's two-year biennium, we got that 39% down to about 10%, which people thought was manageable. But that left a $250 million hole in the second year of the biennium, $600 million if you include the federal match. And our plan was to uh, eliminate that hole by redesigning the delivery system, transforming the Medicaid delivery model to get more value for each dollar spent. And the result was our coordinated care organizations, which was the first effort in the nation to intentionally, on a statewide basis, try to develop a proposal that addressed the triple, triple aim, better care, better quality, uh, and, and at a lower cost. So the coordinated care organizations essentially are local networks of providers that work in their community to take care of people on the Oregon Health Plan, which is our Medicaid program. They operate on a global budget that's, uh, that's indexed to a sustainable growth rate. They're required to integrate and coordinate care across the continuum. They have local accountability for outcomes, uh, resource allocations, uh, and cost. And they have a local governance structure. So each one has a local governing board with a, a variety of different people on it, although those who bear financial risk have a, have a majority. And then a community advisory council that's made up entirely of people who are consumers and don't have any direct relationship with the, um, or with the healthcare system. So each of these coordinated care organizations, we've got 16 or 15 of them, are different. They, they grew up organically and reflected the nature of their community, but they all have to meet certain criteria in terms of outcomes and quality and, and cost management. <clears throat> So the bill, uh, in, in May of 2012, we passed legislation that created the coordinated care organizations, and they began to pop up in August of that year. 
And the bill uh, that created those organizations passed the Oregon House of Representatives, at the time split evenly, 30 to 30, between Democrats and Republicans, by a vote of 53 to 7, in a state that looks like that. And the reason is because people recognized that this was a common shared problem. I mean, Medicaid uh, uh, enrollment is way higher in the red parts of the state than in the blue parts of the state. So we recognized this was a shared problem. We had to solve it. And to do that, we had to transcend partisan politics and come together as a community. And, and that, in fact, is what, is what happened. By that time, however, it was clear that even if we could realize significant gains uh, in, in cost savings, we couldn't capture those quick enough to get them into the current budget. So I went to D.C. in May of 2012 and convinced the Obama administration to give us the 1115 waivers to use this new care model to provide care to the Medicaid population and got a $1.9 billion uh, five-year one-time investment in the care model in exchange for a commitment to reduce the Medicaid trend rate by two percentage points per member per month by the second year of the waiver from 5.5 to 3.5. Uh, with no reduction in enrollment and benefits, and while meeting uh, rigorous metrics around outcome uh, and quality and patient satisfaction. And there were penalties on our side if we didn't, if we didn't meet that. Now this, uh, in essence, was a kind of, uh, of, of per capita growth cap. I mean, that's really what it was. But di it's different than the one being proposed in Congress, is that it requires fundamental change in the delivery model to maintain quality uh, and, and, and outcomes and, 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 and patient satisfaction. And that's why the $1.9 billion investment we got wasn't simply to prop up the Medicaid program during the revenue shortfall of the recession, it was to give us a five-year glide path to gradually shift from the old care model to the new one, and that federal investment gradually went down as cost savings under the CCOs went up. And that's exactly what, what happened. Uh, between 2012 and 2017, we'd reduced the trend rate by 2%. So we had a $2.2 billion total fund savings at the end of five years, and that's expected to grow uh, to $8.6 billion uh, at the end of 10 years. So how, how can this experience help inform the national debate? Well, to understand that, we need to do a quick comparison between the Senate version of Replace and Repeal, which was the uh, Better Care Reconciliation Act, or BICRA, uh, and, and, and the CCO models. So had the Senate bill passed, states would have lost revenue in two significant ways. First, the match rate for this expansion population would have gone from 90% down to what the match rate was before the ACA. In Oregon's uh, case, that's about 60%. And secondly, a per capita growth cap would have slowed down the rate and growth of Medicare. Medicaid. So if you look at that graph, you can see the uh, uh, top bar is uh, the current trend rate and the lower one is the, is the trend rate uh, if the bill had passed. And that's a CBO chart, and it suggests that about $770 million in reduced federal spending on Medicaid would have resulted if this bill had passed. Now, here's comparable data from the Oregon Health Authority. Uh, and again, it's exactly the same. The upper one is the current trend, and the bottom one is with the CCO model. Uh, and it shows uh, that um, we'll have reduced uh, our spend by about $8.6 billion at the end of uh, 10 years. Now, if you look at these two charts, they look exactly the same, right? They're both uh, sort of an inverted B, right? But they're very, very different. The CBO chart reflects a reduction in federal spending on Medicaid simply by cutting payments to states, which is a huge, huge cost shift, and that will result, all things being equal, in a significant reduction uh, in enrollment and or benefits. Whereas this chart reflects an actual reduction, actual cost savings to the state and the federal government, by reducing the cost trend 2% through implementing a new care model, which maintained uh, enrollments and, and, and quality and, and outcome. So my point is, and the take home point is, if we wanna reduce the cost of healthcare in Medicaid or Medicare, and I would argue in the private commercial market, there are two ways to do it. One, you can simply cost shift to somebody else, which is really what the approach in Congress is, in this case to states or you can actually reduce the total cost of care by implementing a new care model while maintaining uh, benefits, quality, and enrollment. Now, we're a very small state, four million people. But if, you, if every state in the nation were to reduce their Medicaid trend rate 2% below the CMS projections uh, and maintain uh, access and quality and outcomes, the 10-year savings would be somewhere between 450 and $500 billion. And if you add a long-term care to this, the savings are much greater. So the point is that there is a way to meet or exceed the Republican 
cost reduction targets without bankrupting states and, and without doing violence to millions of Americans. More significantly, this gives us a pathway to transcend particle, par, partisan politics and actually find a solution. And quite frankly, I think the American people are absolutely hungry for some evidence that that's still possible in this country. So let me just leave you with this. Um, you know, during the many years that I practiced in the emergency room, I can't think of a single time uh, that I checked somebody's party registration before I treated them. I can't remember a single time when I wondered whether Democrats bled differently than Republicans, or whether cancer or cardiovascular disease reflected partisanship or political ideology. So in this divided nation of ours, it seems to me that the one thing that indisputably we share in common, and that should hold us together, is a shared mortality. All of us, whether you live in a red state or a blue state, we share the same brief moment of life, all of us are going to get older. All of us at some point are going to need the medical system to help our, our health. All of us are going to cling to our lives and to the lives of our loved ones. So let's remember that as we go forward. And let's hold that in our hearts as we try to find a solution that works for us as Americans, but also as fellow human beings. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Governor. It feels like we've kind of moved into this place in American healthcare where the, 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 the costs, the prices are just too much, period. Like even high deductible health plans are starting to wreak some havoc on, on people uh, so that even if you're covered, you are still really vulnerable. How do you put that sort of price issue in context of the other periods of, of your career? Well, I mean, it's been a problem. I mean, we were in, in 19, um, 30 years ago, actually, this week, um, we were having a debate in Oregon about resource allocation. The state had discontinued funding for organ transplants in 1987. It was a small budget. It was an optional service at the time. And then someone showed up who needed a transplant right after the legislature went home. And you can imagine the, the controversy. Uh, and 30 years ago, there was an emotion, a motion in front of the legislature to partially refund the transplant program for eight people who had applied. And the debate really, and, and eventually we said no. And the debate really wasn't about transplants, it was about where's the policy that would take eight people and give them transplants when you had 300,000 kids who couldn't even get in the front door. So price has been an issue for a long time. And, and my, my, my experience as a, as a provider and as a, 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 an elected official is that we never deal with price. We deal with how to cost shift it. That this whole thing is all about, is, is about cost shifting. And it's not honest, it's not accountable, and it doesn't solve the problem. And whether it's a tapeworm or a cancer, the fact of the matter is the cost of health care is a drag on our economy. The cost of health care uh, is uh, one of the things that keeps people from moving up uh, the economic scale. I mean, health is the first rung on the ladder of opportunity. It's job training and education to let you climb it, but if you don't have basically good health, you can't get to that second rung. So, um, can I show those that, that one sure. slide? There? Do, sure, uh, please do. do you, uh, my slide's back in there? Here yeah. we go. So, I just want to, so the Affordable Care Act uh, got people covered up to 138% of the federal poverty level which even in itself doesn't work. So this slide shows someone at 148% of the federal poverty level. They make about 17,800 a year, uh, and that's working 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, and after taxes, it's about 15,800. So their pre average premium for an individual now is about $330 a month with a $4,300 deductible. So let's do the math. You, their annual take-home pay, you take away their premiums, now they got 11,000, they got, and then you, uh, they're not gonna get any health care until they pay their deductible. So now they got $6,700 to live on. And then this, uh, look at the household expenses. So rent, I don't know where you can get a, a, an apartment for $450 anymore, but let's assume you could. They end up with $25 um, a week for food, transportation, clothing. You can't live on that. And I do think, whether you like Medicaid or not, it is not just a program for people who aren't working. Everyone in the expansion population, because they're making more than a federal poverty level, have some kind of a job. And it's the scaffolding that actually, one of the scaffoldings that helps people move up. 
So, you know, I, I just think that the, the debate over cost needs to be put in the context of what people can really afford. I know a lot of people who have insurance coverage who basically have a deductible so big that, you know, so we just need to change the conversation and have an honest look at, at, at the cost side of the equation. And not in terms of, of good guys and bad guys, just an objective, dispassionate you know, view, of, view of the system. And until you can engage people in that kind of talk, not defensively, but as people seeking a common solution, I don't think we can get where we need to go. What do you make of this uh, Amazon, <laughs> JP Morgan, Berkshire Hathaway uh, news? Are you, the, the, the word I've heard from a number of folks is good luck, both with cynicism and hope, and can you hire me? <laughs> exactly. What are your thoughts? Uh, on which one? <laughs> uh, on, 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 their, on their endeavor in general. So uh, I, think this is, I think it's actually positive that they did this because I think, first of all, it's an acknowledgement by some pretty big players that healthcare really is a problem, right? And also it's the self-insured market, which is not regulated. Uh, so there's, you know, it's, you know we, we, we tried to do an employer mandate way back in 1989, and of course we ran into ERISA. So this is, potentially this, this, this adds some new players to the debate, right? And so I think there is questions on how they do it, but I do think that this is a, a, positive, a, a positive step. So I think we need to help them be successful, but I think we need to help them be successful in a way that provides a model that could be applied to other self-insured, um, you know, in Oregon it would be a Nike or an Intel, right? Those are the big players. So. Yeah, I think it's a good. I think it's a good thing. Can you? Uh, I don't see any hands going up. It might be. We have plenty of coffee outside. Uh, if you need the caffeine, uh, what, why don't we run a microphone up here to the front? Let me ask one more question while the microphone comes up. Um, why don't you give us a quick overview of the work you're doing with Republican and <coughs> Democratic governors like John Kasich and Governor Hinken Looper and others? So basically, I think uh, many governors <clears throat> are concerned that the uh, expansion will simply be defunded. It could be defunded through the budget. There's a lot of ways that could happen. Um, and so um, the strategy of the Democrats, and, and I think a lot of the industry who didn't want this thing repealed, was simply to oppose it without an alternative, right? Opposition without alternative. And that puts someone like a, a Senator Murkowski in a really tough spot. Uh, you know, making her, asking her again to say no to her party with nothing, no, no alternative. So I think, I think we need an offense. I think we need to acknowledge that there are, uh, um, as, as Steve Love mentioned last night, there are real problems with the ACA. So let's fix them, right? And to do that, you have to have an alternative. You have to have an offense. And so the notion is to try to uh, get a number of states, a bipartisan group of states, who would propose a state-driven bipartisan alternative to look at some of the problems with the ACA, uh, built on this concept we had, had in Oregon, uh, and to try to get that in, uh, in this session of Congress so that you at least have you know, the, the, the vehicle to have a different and broader, and broader conversation. So that's, uh, that we're gonna be meeting back uh, sometime around the NGA and um, see whether, whether we can put something like that together. NGA is the National Governors yeah. Association. Could you give us can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Could you give us some examples of the cost out strategies that um, came out of some of your CCOs? So what did they do to change the cost structure? Uh, so first of all, they had a, a, they had a hard growth cap, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, I, it, the fact is that it's not that hard, I think, to reduce the cost of health care if you actually have to do it. Uh, so first of all, they had, they, they had the 3.4% they had the, uh, the growth rate. Now, from a physician standpoint, they like, actually like that because Medicaid funding, reimbursement at least for physicians, went up and down based on the fiscal health of the general fund. This gives them a, 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 a sort of a predictable growth rate. Uh, so they did a lot of things. We, had, we have a series of metrics. Uh, they're performance metrics, so we withhold part of the a portion of the, uh, of the global budget. Uh, and then the, the providers get that back if they meet certain metrics. So some obvious ones were reduction in ED visits, uh, a reduction in readmissions for CHF and adult asthma, uh, and, and things of that nature. But we also had uh, preventive ones, the number of uh, well child visits, uh, 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 developmental uh, screens that a child got. Uh, so there's a whole series of those. Uh, and then there were cost sharing arrangements so that if you could reduce your hospital rate, that th those cost savings within the cap were split between the hospitals and the, uh, and the, uh, and the, and the physicians. Um, and I also think that the local nature of these delivery models um, provided um, 
a space where the different providers in the community could get together and have conversations and, 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 and really fostered collaboration. Uh, and we're trying to gradually increase the portion of the global budget that's with, withheld and then pay based on quality and outcomes rather than simply, uh, simply volume. And this is all online. If you, if you just go to the Oregon Health Authority and then look at the CCO metrics, uh, you, can, you can see the, and it's, the, the, it's been pretty, pretty, pretty remarkable. Now I will say, uh, and that does not mean to offend anybody in the room, but any global budget has got to deal sooner or later, probably sooner, with those aspects of the system that are not capitated. So hospital inpatient costs, uh, pharmacy, DME, uh, medical devices, some, you have to figure out a way to deal with those because those, you know, those can actually blow up a, uh, uh, a capitated budget. We're having those conversations. Can have a capitated or fixed at the top <clears throat> without some mechanism to mitigate uh, uh, cost growth that exceeds that cap. Right, so, so EX51, this new drug for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is, you know, I don't know, seven hundred, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000 a pop, you get a couple of cases of those in a little CCO and you're and they're, they're finding that. I mean, pharmacy is a big problem for, for all the CCOs right now because it's not just increases in, in specialty drugs. There are some pretty dramatic increases in, uh, in generics as well. Mm -hmm. So s some of the characteristics of CCOs, there's generally speaking just one in a, in a geography, <coughs> not, not uniformly, but just one risk-bearing entity in, in a geography, uh, integrates behavioral health, physical health, has relatively flexible benefit design, uh, talk about the governance structure a little bit. So, so the governance structure, again, these are all local. We didn't do like a bid. We just laid out the criteria and people applied. And it's very interesting. If you look at Oregon, they are almost all within sort of a geographically defined area. We've got one on the east side, which is all rural. So, I mean, a third of the state's got one very, very rural CCO. And so that's developed in a different way than the one in Portland. But the, uh, the local governing structure creates a space where people actually come together. They were requir all required to do every three years a community health assessment, which they do in conjunction with, with the hospitals. So they have this common database on what the problems are. And then they develop a, uh, a community health improvement plan. And in that plan, they've developed, I think, pretty robust partnerships with other sectors that are working more in the social determinants area, which is not a... Uh, really a core competency of a hospital or a coordinated care organization, but there's a growing recognition that if you have a, a fixed budget, you have a vested and an economic interest in reducing, for example, childhood diabetes, because those, that's going to end up in uh, a big cost as you come into the, uh, come to the system. And I, and I do think that it's that local nature where people know each other, they lived with each other, you know, the kids go to school together. It really does create a different, uh, a different context for, uh, for, for addressing this problem. Mm -hmm. Other questions in the audience? Governor, when you say a different dynamic based on sort of the local governance structure, does that mean compared to being in the state capital and having turf wars over uh, how to manage the cost containment? Yeah, it, 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 in essence. So what we did is we, so the, 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 it's actually the state overall state budget that grows at 3.4%. That was the agreement with CMS. So that is allocated to, in a lump sum to each coordinated care organization with some, you know, some risk adjustments to based on where it is. Then after that, it, uh, it's up to them to figure it out. And um, uh, so, for example, uh, we're not, we don't try to micromanage it. So basically, one CCO can do it one way, another one can do it another way. Uh, APMs are really less relevant because you have a budget and a set of outcomes and what's, what, what's critical is that you live within your budget and you produce those outcomes and that's, that's what's created that local, uh, that local innovation uh, and I think people in Oregon, I'm, I'm sure in Texas, are pretty resistant to somebody in the capital sort of telling them what to do and it's generally legislators who have absolutely no background in, in healthcare delivery. <clears throat> there are efforts to try to make one big state, there are efforts, ongoing efforts to try to regulate them more. Uh, and we've all resisted that because as long as they're working, they're working. And, 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 and that local ownership is pretty critical. <clears throat> Could you say more about the integration of behavioral health and substance abuse services? Yeah, that's, I, mean, I will, just on the front, that, we're still struggling with that. But I mean, we've, we've got it on the table. <clears throat> so a lot of physicians, are, we're, we're beginning to do two things. We're beginning to co-locate a, a behavioral health provider in primary care clinics, but also a primary care provider in, in mental health clinics. Uh, I think, uh, uh, and, and there's a growing recognition that, you know, when we, that we, we need to do more than financial integration. We actually need to do 
clinical integration as well. And often when you think about mental health integration or behavioral health integration, you think about what I just said, the co-location of the providers. We don't often think as much about things like, you know, maternal depression and some of those early indicators that, are, that, 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 that lead to behavioral mental health issues. And that's where the, sort of the social determinants come in. I think the biggest problem is financing. If you look in, at HealthShare, which is the big CCO in Portland, I think they spend, of each of their dollars, I think they spend something like 50, I'm gonna make, it's, it's close, but these are rough figures, maybe 52, 55% cents on the dollar on physical health. And it's like, you know, three cents on the dollar on behavioral health and two cents on the dollar on, you know, addiction services. So it, the, the challenge is to reallocate those dollars within the cap budget and begin to move more of on, on the front end. And there's no question, but that saves you huge amounts of money downstream, but it's sort of an accounting and cash flow problem. Uh, uh, but uh, they're, uh, this is something that they're all engaged in. Again, if you go to uh, the website and look up HealthShare, uh, it, which is the Portland CCO, they've actually done some very uh, creative things on the, uh, on the, on the behavioral health uh, side. And that's our big urban CCO where you've got a, a, you know, high levels of, of, of homelessness, home, homelessness, for example, much of it driven by uh, addiction issues, behavioral health issues. One of the things I, I know we have a question here, but one of the things I recall HealthShare studied and, and determined in Portland was that uh, if for some of their most chronic homeless uh, folks, that if you just got them uh, stable housing, then it would, that cost would be more than offset by savings and pharmacy uh, alone. Yeah, and, and in fact, the, the, the f uh, big hospital systems in Portland collaborated and uh, took out of their community benefit resources or whatever resources, I'm not quite sure where they got them, but they invested $21 million to build three low-income housing units in Portland and then a sort of a uh, Alameda County style uh, psychiatric e ED where you, where you can you know, bring people in crisis and then get them back out into, in, into the community. And, and the expansion of the ACA, the nice thing it did is now almost everybody below 138% of the federal, federal poverty level has financing for mental health and, 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 and behavioral health services. Right, so the question is the resources are there and how do we then begin to uh, massage the structure to make that a much higher priority in, in, in terms of the... Hi, my name is Crystal Brown and I'm actually a mom of a medically dependent fragile child here in the state of mm -hmm. Texas. Mm -hmm. I'm also part of a group, uh, it's called Protect Texas Fragile Kids. Um, it's about 10 to 20 parents who are trying <clears throat> to have these conversations from the ground up what would be your advice for our organization when we've tried to have conversations with people at HHSC and legislators and we're not quite being heard? Um, we're trying to uh, speak from the ground up what's happening with our kids because you've got kids from birth who were born, um, parents like my husband's a City of Austin firefighter. Mm -hmm. He's also with the Texas Task Force. So we're definitely part of the working population who need Medicaid as a secondary insurer just for our child to live. Um, to afford medications, hospitalizations, DME supplies, all of that. Um, and I feel like I could talk to you all day, but the question is, you know, really, if we don't feel like we're being heard um, or our questions are being answered, where do you think we should turn to next? <laughs> Oh, that's a tough question. Um, you know, you, this is a much bigger state than my state, right? We, 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 we've got, uh, you know, f four million people. Uh, my experience, uh, having served in the legislature uh, a as well as uh, the governor's office, is that stories are extremely powerful. And the more individual legislators you can get in front of with those stories, that's what changes people's minds is, is you know, when you're sitting in, with a budget and you're making a decision that you need to balance the budget and one of the ways you're going to balance it is to reduce eligibility for the medically needy program, that's a, 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 an accounting exercise for you sitting in, in, in your state capital. But it's a real human story for someone who just lost coverage. And I do think a lot of legislators, this is not a criticism, the fact is most legislators don't have a healthcare background and that's an extremely complicated system. And I think putting the problems into, into huge stories and putting a human face on those stories is, ab is absolutely critical. And you could probably, from some of the folks in this room, figure out who the 15 key people in the legislature who need to get it are to, to make it happen. 
You know, I mean, I'm sure it's your lieutenant governor, for example, your speaker of the house. I don't know who the key people are, so it's not the entire legislator. It's a handful of people who you have to convince. And I would guess what I'd do is just focus my, my efforts on trying to get to them, to get people in front of them, people they know, people from their district, people they respect. Uh, and I guess I'd start there. How do you, uh, what if they refuse to meet with you? Because <laughs> that's kind of one of the biggest issues is we know who the key players are and who we need to reach. The problem is they don't want to talk to us. And it's our kids' lives that are being affected. And we are, we're not going to take it lightly. Um, it's, it's their children. And that's, they, they refuse to meet with us. And so I guess what would be your recommendation then? Who? Well, I guess I would, I guess if I was, if this was happening, all right, I'd try to find, <clears throat> A, a way to make your megaphone bigger and actually talk about the fact that here's the problem and people who are elected are simply, it's not that they disagree with it, they just won't even meet with you. I mean, I think in this uh, <laughs> unfortunate world of tabloid media, that's a pretty good story. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I just think you, you need to figure out how to get that up. I, I know you're frustrated. I don't have a magic bullet, but it, it, you know, it's one of, the, uh, one of the downsides of representative democracy if people simply won't even listen to you. Uh, maybe there are other people that you could find that would listen to you who, who would be, uh, I'll just end after this, but <clears throat> let's say you have, I, I, don't, I have no idea what the makeup of your legislature is, I think I can guess, um, but there's gotta be two or three people who the speaker or the lieutenant governor depend on to, to get their own agenda through, their agenda that doesn't have anything to do with healthcare. I'd find two or three people who, are, who would listen to you who could actually raise that issue at those critical moments when they're trying to get their vote for something else. I mean, there's ways to get it in, and uh, um, God bless you for trying, and I, I wouldn't give up. I do think, I think we're gonna make, this is gonna happen, I think it's good, but I think it's gonna take a, a real effort, uh, and mostly it's about, I think it's about the stories. <clears throat> Let's go over here for a question. Can you touch on some of the opportunities you may see in long-term care as it relates to both spending <coughs> and quality? So I can share my, sort of my views from Oregon. I don't know whether those are transferable to Texas. So in Oregon, the biggest, we, were, we had a waiver in 1979 to uh, basically move to home and community-based care. So we've really reduced our, our, our sort of institutional population. If you look at where the cost increases are in long-term care, they're in in-home services primarily. Uh, so there's two issues. Uh, we're trying to pay the, the workforce more than they were. They were just minimum wage folks with no benefits. And you cannot provide good long-term care services unless you professionalize that workforce. So that is a cost, getting those wages up so that you can, and, and getting the training so it's a stable workforce, that's really critical. If you don't do that, you're gonna pay those costs when those folks get into the hospital unnecessarily. So that's, that's a difficult area. Where does the money come from? And I do think that part of that money should come from the cost savings in the healthcare system. Some of that needs to go on the front end to train the workforce of of the, of the next 20 years, which is gonna look completely different from the workforce that we have now. It's gonna be a professionalized in-home uh, a, a workforce. It's gonna be a lot more community health workers and social workers who are all working in, in unison. The second thing is there's a disincentive with the duels. There's no incentive for a nursing home to actually keep people out of an acute care setting because they don't have to pay for it. Because part of it's Medicaid and part of it's Medicare. So we need to align the risk for that, for that management part. Um, so those are two things that we're working on. Uh, the, uh, the big one that I don't think anyone's talking about is about 2030, there's gonna be this dramatic spike in long-term care costs because that's when the baby boomers start hitting 85. And it's the, really the 85 plus folks that, that, that drive that conversation. We need to be talking about that now and, and, and asking what we're gonna have to do to the system now since we have you know, about a 12 year runway because that's gonna go on for 20 years once we hit that and that's demographics and there's nothing you can do about that. But what we can do is get it ahead of the curve and start thinking about how we need to tweak the system on the front end uh, in order to be able to manage that, uh, that uh, bolus of people my age that are gonna become a huge drag in the system. Governor, thank you for sharing your thoughts and sharing your story. Let's, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you.